The Liberty Weekly Podcast is brought to you by Tom Woods Liberty Classroom. Sick of losing arguments with your statist friends? Fear no more. Now you can vanquish your intellectual foes with courses taught by top libertarian professors. Tool your intellectual arsenal and enroll today by navigating to www.libertyweekly.net forward slash Liberty Classroom or by following the link in the show notes page. The Constitution has no inherent authority or obligation. It has no authority or obligation at all, unless as a contract between man and man. And it does not so much as even purport to be a contract between persons now existing. Furthermore, we know historically that only a small portion even of the people then existing were consulted on the subject, or asked or permitted to express either their consent or dissent in any formal manner. Those persons, if any, who did give their consent formally are all dead now, and the Constitution, so far as it was their contract, died with them. They had no natural power or right to make it obligatory on their children. It is not only plainly impossible in the nature of things that they could bind their posterity, but they did not even attempt to bind them. Nevertheless, the writer thinks it proper to say that in his opinion, the Constitution is no such instrument as it has generally been assumed to be, but that by false interpretations and naked usurpations, the government has been made in practice a very widely and almost wholly different thing from what the Constitution itself purports to authorize. He has heretofore written much, and could write much more to prove that such is the truth. But whether the Constitution really be one thing or another, this much is certain, that it is either authorized such a government as we have had, or has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McFarlane, and today I'm actually not being joined by my co-host, Jerry McCullum, as he is on vacation with his family this week. So welcome, everyone, to episode 27, uh, in which I will be giving a limited biography of Lysander Spooner, a very famous historical figure in our movement. But before I get into the meat of this episode, I have a couple of announcements to make and some housekeeping measures to take care of as well. And so it's that time of year again, everyone. Uh, I'm not talking about August, which seems to be the premier month for political unrest, as we can see with what's happening across the country. But I'm talking about back to school season. So this week was back to school week for me. Uh, I'm starting my third and final year of law school. But of course, those of you who follow the show on social media already knew this. Uh, because I've been whining about it quite a bit on social media. But in all seriousness, getting back to school is going to present a little bit of a challenge for our young podcast, uh, seeing as that I only created the show last May. Uh, we're already on episode 27, but challenges and changes in circumstances like this can present quite a barrier to get over for a show such as this. But with challenge comes opportunity. And uh, what opportunity, you may ask? Well, Jerry has mentioned to me quite a few times that considering I am approaching the end of my legal training, it would probably make sense for me to actually talk about libertarianism and the law on the podcast. Imagine that, you know? So while I can tell you that law school is a bit of an ordeal, and I don't say that to look like a martyr, Uh, because it's all self-imposed, but I do say that because it really is quite the experience, and it's pretty challenging. It's probably the hardest thing that I've ever had to do in my life. That being said, over the summer when I was on break, law school and the law were the absolute last things that I wanted to be thinking about. I just wanted a break. Now that school is back in session, I'll be thinking a lot more about the law and I'll be dealing with it a lot in my daily life, uh, studying and stuff like that, so I could bring it more to the podcast. But it will also be a lot more difficult for Jerry and I to meet face-to-face every week to record podcast episodes. But in addition to that, I've also started to feel like I really wanted the show to be more than just a discussion-based show. I know that a lot of people like the discussion-based aspect of it because Jerry and I have a real good rapport together. 
but I really wanted to be able to present a higher volume of evidence and solid educational information. And I feel like pursuing this line of development will bring a lot more value to the podcast and to you all as the listeners, obviously. Uh, I still do want to include the discussion-based format. I'm still trying to kind of think, think about how that would work its way in. And it all kind of depends on how Jerry and I will be able to get together and meet during the school year here. So this first show in the school year will be a bit of a pilot episode for more scholarly but fun work in which I'm going to take on a bit more of a Corbett Report style approach where the podcast content will be more scripted and will be presented in more of a presentation documentation style format. And of course, as I said, this new style is in a bit of a trial mode for me for the three scheduled shows for which Jerry will be unavailable this coming week. And if it's working, we'll find a way to reincorporate our discussions. But if it's not, please let me know and we'll see how it works and we'll see what we can do to adapt. Uh, But for now, I'm certainly excited at the prospect of being able to bring on more scholarly work for you guys to learn a bit more in depth. So like I said, as always, your feedback as the audience will really help let me know if it is working or not in this transitionary period. Otherwise, I'll be going off of my feels. So aside from that big announcement, I have a few housekeeping measures to take care of. Uh, There's a budding community growing over at our Facebook page, and I wanted to send shout-outs to the listeners there who have been interacting with me. They are Corey, Trevor, Dallas, Steven, Jared, Derek, and Brian. So thanks to you guys for interacting with me on Facebook. Uh, It really does help the show to see what you guys are thinking, what you guys care about and to get some of your input for future podcast episodes. That's been really helpful and encouraging to me, so thank you guys a lot. Also, I'm in the process currently of starting a Patreon account for three purposes. One is to give listeners greater access to the show. Two is to enhance the Liberty Weekly listening experience. And three is to help fund the show as well, obviously. I promise not to lock any content behind a paywall besides maybe one subscriber-only episode per month where I will give a little talk about a status report of the show itself and what we're doing behind the scenes here. Of course, there would be other perks, and I really, really desire feedback here and suggestions as for as to what perks to offer. I do have a few ideas brewing for subscriber bonuses, but the best would the best ones would probably come from you guys. So if you have any suggestions, leave us a message via our SpeakPipe application, which you can find by clicking on the Leave Voicemail tab next to the right-hand scroll bar at libertyweekly.net. Or if that isn't your fancy, please do email me directly at patrick.mcfarlane at libertyweekly.net. That's P-A-T-R-I-C-K dot m-a-c-f-a-r-l-a-n-e at libertyweekly.net if even that isn't your fancy you can find us on facebook at facebook.com forward slash liberty weekly other than that i've been working on our next ebook which will include our practical tips for living a more free life and i emphasize that these are simply things that we here at the show have done or tried that we think might help bring value to your lives as well and to bring you a feeling of being a bit more free in spite of the state and uh, in that will be some tips Uh, on topics such as self-education, personal finance, internet privacy, and other skill-building activities that we've done ourselves here. So there are three calls of action for all my listeners to wrap up the housekeeping portion here. One is give me ideas that you would be interested in in the way of Patreon subscriber bonuses. Two is to leave us SpeakPipe voicemail about the new format that we're testing here today and three would be to join our budding facebook community at facebook.com forward slash liberty weekly so thanks for bearing with me through a bit of transitionary content some announcements and some housekeeping measures here Uh, now without further ado let's get on to the meat of today's episode so in the mainstream lysander spooner is widely known as a radical abolitionist who argued against the constitutionality of slavery. And in fact, most of the scholarly articles that I came across in my Nexus Lexus legal research for this episode dealt with the aptly titled The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, his 1845 pamphlet that Wikipedia states is Spooner's, quote, most famous work. Outside of the mainstream, however, 
Spooner offers what many libertarian legal theorists herald as an irrefutable refutation of constitutional authority. This aspect of his career is not as highly touted by the legal mainstream legal community as his arguments against slavery, which makes a whole lot of sense. Now, Lysander Spooner was born on his father's farm near Atoll, Massachusetts, and I apologize if I'm butchering any pronunciations here. Uh, I know I have some listeners in Massachusetts, so sorry guys. But so he was born on his father's farm in Massachusetts to what would become a large abolitionist family. And in fact, it was a great comfort to Lysander Spooner that his mother was able to read his work, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, on her deathbed, and she expressed, quote, great pleasure in his work. Now, Lysander did not write of his father, Asa Spooner, but according to a family genealogist, he was a figure of, quote, great independence and individuality of character. From ages 16 to 25, Spooner was bound by a formal agreement to repay his father for having reared him. And this is because of the fact that Spooner did not leave the house during adolescence per local custom. So the, during this time, Spooner worked as a school teacher and as a tutor for a wealthy family in Wichenden, Massachusetts. Correspondingly, after his debt to his father was repaid, Spooner was free to pursue a career in the legal field and subsequently began his legal study after working for a time in a store and as a clerk for the Registrar of Deeds in Worcestershire. And as for his legal training, in 1833, Spooner began his studies in the offices of John Davis, who later served several terms as governor and later as a member of the U.S. Senate as a prominent member of the Whigs. Now, Spooner was also educated by Charles Allen, a jurist and state senator from Worcestershire who later served as Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court. As if a premonition of his nascent career, Spooner entered the legal field as a radical by breaking a Massachusetts court rule that required legal apprentices without any college degree to complete five years of legal study before gaining admittance to the bar as opposed to college-educated applicants, of which only three years were required. Now, Spooner was not formally college educated, and after only three years, he ignored this rule and began to practice law anyways, simultaneously publishing an open petition in the Worcestershire Republican newspaper, arguing that the law discriminated against the educated poor and provided monopoly income to classically trained individuals. Now, with the help and influence of his instructors, the requirement was voted down in the next session. Moreover, libertarians will find it interesting, yet unsurprising, that Spooner made a familiar argument against occupational licensure, claiming that it is a violation of freedom of contract, which is a natural right inherent to property rights. Despite Spooner's promising entrance into the legal field, field, his career was lackluster. In tandem with his ardent and outspoken critiques against organized religion and the struggling rural New England economy, clients were hard to come by, thus prompting Spooner to leave Worcestershire after only a year in practice. After a brief stint working for Albert Gallatin, who was then president of the National Bank of New York City, Spooner had earned enough money to head west to Ohio, where he participated in a real estate boom that ended in the Panic of 1837, the details of which I won't get into here. And as a side note, Gallatin should be famil a familiar figure to listeners from way back in episode two of the podcast. Albert Gallatin was a Jeff Jeffersonian Democrat Republican who was minority leader for the House Republicans and was subsequently targeted by the Federalists through the Alien and Sedition Acts. So I would point you guys back to episode two of the podcast to hear a little bit more about that situation there and about the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. But back to Lysander Spooner now. After failing in his Ohio real estate speculation, which involved a lawsuit that I may cover later on in the podcast, Spooner returned to his father's farm in 1840. Now, Spooner probably correctly attributed his failed real estate venture to unsound banking practices, which served as the inspiration for his works, a new system of paper currency, and his legal defense of his new proposed banking system in, quote, constitutional law relative to credit, currency, and banking. 
And since I'm new in my study of Lysander Spooner, I haven't been able to read these works yet, but additionally, their details are beyond the scope of this episode. But in the next chapter of his life, Spooner returned to New York City to open a private alternative to the United States Postal Service, which was entitled, quote, The American Letter Mail Company. Accompanying the establishment of his own postal service, Spooner published his pamphlet, quote, The Unconstitutionality of the Laws of Congress Prohibiting Private Mails, a pamphlet which he included with a personal letter to the Postmaster General of the United States. His private mail service soon became very successful, eventually encompassing the majority of the mail services between Boston, New York, Philadelphia and Baltimore. And seeing as their monopoly had been challenged, the government did not like this and used extra legal methods to sabotage Spooner's business, effectively driving Spooner out of the market in July of 1844. And in the wake of his defeat, Spooner returned to the family farm and was subsequently reduced to total poverty. Once back on the farm, Spooner set his sights on the slavery issue, partly because abolitionist sentiment was already high in New England and because the immorality of slavery was already a Apparent to many in the North, Spooner believed that he did not have to demonstrate the evils of slavery as much as he had to present a convincing legal argument against it. Spooner ultimately advocated the defeat of slavery through chaotic legal activism not political or moral means, and I say legal as in through the law and not necessarily within the standing law, if that makes sense. This sentiment gelled with New England abolitionists such as Garrett Smith, who departed with the somewhat impractical and unidimensional moral arguments advanced by William Lloyd Garrison and his followers. Subsequently, Garrett Smith agreed to finance Spooner's work in arguing that the Constitution fundamentally did not allow slavery. And this relationship between Garrett Smith and Lysander Spooner would continue for the majority of Lysander Spooner's life and career. Subsequently, Spooner's work at this time resulted in the 1845 publication of The Unconstitutionality of Slavery and other abolitionist works such as In Defense for Fugitive Slaves, which was published in 1850. While Spooner denied the validity of the Constitution, his constitutional argument against slavery rested upon the idea that the Constitution created a very limited federal United States citizenship that, that extended to all people born in the United States. And despite this federal citizenship, he still maintained that the states retained the right of secession and individuals still had the power to nullify unconstitutional laws, both through state and jury nullification. And while Spooner's arguments against slavery rested on natural theories, natural law theories, and the logically implied deductions derived from the Constitution itself, but some of his arguments failed to comport with other similarly minded abolitionists because it logically implied the invalidity of government in general. I'm sure many other activists would see his theories as being impractical. Despite this fact, Throughout his activism, Spooner remained in the practice of law, but chose instead to focus his effort on his activism, appearing pro bono for any clients he represented in court, despite the fact that, that by many accounts, he probably could have made a fortune in a conventional legal practice. But nonetheless, he remained in poverty. And I don't think that this was a choice made by Spooner. I think that he just followed his instincts here and maybe for forewent a little bit of wealth for his activism, but that's speculation on my part. Now, at one point, he was offered a job in the customs house, but turned it down because taxation is theft, and he didn't want to be paid stolen money. Although, I think, judging from earlier in this, in this podcast, I was talking about how he did have a job in a clerking office, um, but maybe his theories weren't as well developed at that point in time because it was before his study of the law itself. But from his experiences appearing pro bono through the end of the 1840s and the beginning of the 1850s, Spooner became repulsed by the injustices of the legal system. In 1851, Spooner began working on his masterpiece, trial by jury in which he appealed to the public to enforce the rights of juries. In so doing, he relied on the Magna Carta and eschewed the United States Constitution. The work was later published in the late fall of 1852. Now here's a little juice, a juicy little quote for y'all. Quote, in a letter to Garrett Smith, I'm quoting my source material here that I'll link in the show notes page below. Quote, in a letter to Garrett Smith, Spooner later argued that the Constitution could not be supported by, quote, honest men who know its true character. Spooner felt at liberty, nonetheless, 
quote, to interpret the Constitution on those points wherein it is right, and then to appeal to those who profess to be governed by it to act up to their own standards. Basically, Spooner argues that juries should be a judge of both the facts and the law. And for a quick explanation of what that means, I will offer this. In our legal system, the court renders decisions based on how the court believes the law applies to a certain set of facts. And in order to determine what is true and what isn't true, i.e. what the facts are, the court needs what is called, quote, a finder of fact. And in our English system of law, either the judge can serve as a fact finder or a jury can do that. But in our system, the fact finder will hear the evidence presented by both parties. In determining the objective truth, the fact finder is aided by the rules of evidence, which are traditional mechanisms that seek to ensure the veracity of the evidence that the jury hears, such as cross-examination and the rule against hearsay. Throughout the 1850s, Spooner became more absorbed in abolitionist activism. Much of this activism focused around the logic that slaves should arm themselves in rebellion to resist their physical capture in a form of guerrilla warfare. There is evidence, there's evidence to suggest that John Brown might have been directly influenced by Spooner's writings in the lead-up to the famous raid on Harper's Ferry. And in fact, John Brown did meet briefly with Lysander Spooner in Boston shortly before the raid. And there's also speculation that Brown received funding from Garrett Smith, the same benefactor that supported Lysander Spooner's activism. Uh, after lending aid to John Brown, who was imprisoned following Harper's Ferry, Spooner went so far as to plan a mission to kidnap Governor Henry Wise of Virginia and hold him hostage so that he could be used in exchange for John Brown's release. However, the plot failed in its advanced planning stages for want of funding and support from wealthy activists who feared the consequences. Shocking and exciting as this cloak and dagger work was, it is even more shocking that there is evidence to suggest Spooner was planning similar events to be carried out in places like Ohio and New York. To get more into what Spooner himself believed in terms of tactics... Despite advocating more power on behalf of the people through states' rights and jury nullification, Spooner seemed to simultaneously share a contempt for the public at large. He wrote in 1857, quote, The idea of going to the people at large on this question seems to me utterly futile. He's talking about slavery here. The mass of them have neither time nor inclination for such investigations. Although, having made these statements, he concluded that people, quote, would march up to the cannon's mouth in defense of the principles of my argument if the lawyers all told them that they were sound, which is prophetic in light of how many people would do literally just that during the next decade and the war to prevent Southern secession. Now, during this time, Spooner lent his hand in other spheres. In 1855, he published his longest and incomplete work, The Law of Intellectual Property. And uh, now I've I have admitted that IP is not an area that I have expertise in, but I have heard libertarian arguments. Through my research for this episode, I've concluded that Spooner thought that the IP laws at the time were both unconstitutional and failed to adequately protect intellectual property, and it seems that Spooner did in fact believe that labor of the mind produced property in just the same way that manual labor does. But like I said, my opinion is not well developed in the way of intellectual property, so I will not make any more comments on that specifically. Now by the mid to late 1850s, Spooner, still pressed for money, turned to inventions and obtained a patent for elastic chair bottoms along with other inventions that he had made for beds and chairs. As we can see, this guy was really a jack of all trades and he tried as we'll see later on, he tried so many different things to make money in his life. Like many of his earlier pursuits, this was short-lived, and by 1863, Spooner had abandoned inventing and instead funded the Spooner Copyright Company in order to sell his earlier, earlier banking ideas published in his 1861 pamphlet, New System of Paper Currency. And following the war to prevent Southern secession, Spooner faded a bit from public relevance, yet continued to publish pamphlets on various economic and political issues. Issues. The late 1860s saw the publication of some of Spooner's most famous anarchist writings, most famous in hindsight, No Treason, Numbers 1, 2, and 6, all confronted the evils of and propaganda associated with Reconstruction. Spooner argued among
amongst many other things, that constitutionally rebellion was not treason and that the Constitution lacked any inherent authority because it lacked legal elements of contract formation, lacked any specific time requirements, and was impossible to make legally binding upon our posterity. We definitely will dig into these pieces in other episodes of the podcast here. Now, although Spooner was producing anarchist work throughout his career, it wasn't until the 1870s that he really became involved with other American individualist anarchists like Benjamin Tucker, Josiah Warren, Stephen Pearl Andrews, and Edward Linton. Now, I also must admit that I have not adequately studied the history of individualist anarchism in the United States, so I won't go deep into the details of that scene here in this episode, but I can say that Spooner rejected notions of communal property, noting in 1886, quote, the right of property is the right of supreme, absolute, and irresponsible dominion over anything that is naturally a subject of property, that is, of ownership. It is a right against all the world. In the later years of his life, Spooner often contributed to Benjamin Tucker's Liberty, where he advocated pseudo-voluntarian ideas and pondered how a society based solely on individualism could facilitate social cooperation. In his final days, he spent a great deal of time in the library reading and writing. Upon Spooner's death, his obituary read, quote, Spooner died at one o'clock in the afternoon of Saturday, May 14th, 1887, in his little room at 109 Myrtle Street, surrounded by trunks and chests, bursting with the books, manuscripts, and pamphlets which he had gathered about him in his active pamphleteer's warfare over half a century ago. Furthermore, his friend Benjamin Tucker had this to say, quote, On any day except Sunday, for as many years back as the present writer can remember, a visitor at the Boston Athenium Library between the hours of nine and three might have noticed as nearly all did notice, in one of the alcoves overlooking Tremont Street across the old granary burying ground, the stooping figure of an aged man, bending over a desk piled high with dusty volumes of history, jurisprudence, political science, and constitutional law, and busily absorbed in studying and writing. Had the old man chanced to raise his head for a moment, the visitor would have seen, framed in long and snowy hair and beard, one of the finest, kindliest, sweetest, strongest grandest faces that ever gladdened the eyes of man pretty high and feely praise there from benjamin tucker about his friend so with those kind words i will wrap up the short biography episode on the life of lysander spooner although there's much more to his story i do hope that this episode was able to give you all some more background on a truly magnificent figure that we all really do hear name drop so often And so with that being said, I would urge all of you to check out my source material for more information on Lysander Spooner specifically, uh, which I I will link in the show notes page here. I have to say, though, that one of the best resources that I've been drawing from to make these more fact-laden shows is from Liberty Classroom. Specifically, there are two incredible courses taught by Professor Gerard Casey entitled The History of Political Thought, Parts 1 and 2. And in preparation for this episode, I viewed Professor Casey's lecture on Lysander Spooner and found his insights very helpful for framing Lysander Spooner in more of a modern-day libertarian voluntarist lens, which is something that I will certainly do in later episodes here because of the importance of Lysander Spooner's thoughts and his work. And uh, although this episode was more of a bio Some facts from Gerard Casey's lecture will certainly appear in those later episodes that I'm planning. And as always, I would certainly recommend Liberty Classroom to all of my listeners. I've found the content there to be incredibly helpful in organizing this show. And uh, plus, as an affiliate, I get 50% of your subscription fee. So your purchase would also be helping to support the podcast in a win-win-win type situation. So to help support the show and grow our own knowledge, I'll direct you to libertyweekly.net forward slash Liberty Classroom. Uh, But before you do that, grab yourself some coupons through the Liberty Weekly resources page at libertyweekly.net forward slash resources. I believe the coupons will get you 20% off of the subscription price here. So that being said, in addition, I would urge all my listeners to sign up for our email list where you will receive our free ebooks and personalized content updates from me. Also, as I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast, I would urge you all to join our fledgling Facebook community where I've been interacting with some great like-minded listeners. Also, please do leave us voicemail on our SpeakPipe app by navigating to our website at libertyweekly.net. That tab is collecting spiderwebs 
and dust from unuse. So I would urge you guys, please do leave us some voicemail and we'll be sure to pop it in the show or work it in with the show in some way. And as always, if this is your first time listening to the show, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. Or better yet, please tell a friend about the podcast because that is the way that podcasts grow is by word of mouth. And so all of you who have already been telling Uh, You know, all your friends and your mom about the Liberty Weekly Podcast. Many, many thanks. Please keep doing it. And as always, I'm your host, Patrick McFarlane. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hey, everyone. Pat McFarlane here. As a listener of the Liberty Weekly Podcast, you have probably heard of our feature program, Thought Crime Thursdays. If you enjoy perusing the world of dystopian fiction, you will love the course Sci-Fi, Liberty, and Dystopia. Taught by Professor Brad Berzer, a frequent guest on The Tom Woods Show, Sci-Fi, Liberty, and Dystopia is one of the most popular courses available exclusively through Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. Correspondingly, it is also where I have been drawing inspiration for future installments of Thought Crime Thursdays. To gain access to this course and 18 others taught by top libertarian professors, join through our affiliate link by navigating to libertyweekly.net forward slash libertyclassroom or follow the link in the show notes page.